Um, this is a, a really important area. Um, you know, we, we talked about inflammation uh, yesterday in our in the pipeline series, and uh, you know, part of that discussion was the fact that um, the absence of dystrophin was really a big contributor to that weakening of the muscle membrane. And, and as we'll talk about over the next couple of days, it's really that root cause. So as we know, the the lack of dystrophin causes a whole host of uh, challenges in this disease. And so the, the strategies and the potential therapies as well as proof therapies that we're gonna talk about um, in this session are all aimed at addressing that root problem and trying to uh, restore production of uh, the dystrophin protein in the cells. So we're gonna go all the way back to the DMD gene and kind of walk out from there to give a little bit of an explanation. Um, so as I'm sure most of the people watching are aware, uh, the DMD gene is comprised of 79 exons and those exons uh, contain the information uh, that's gonna be needed to make uh, the protein. So from the gene, we have that information transcribed into uh, the messenger RNA and it's there in the messenger RNA where all of the exons need to be lined up kind of like pieces of the puzzle. Um, and then that can be translated into the protein. So when we think about what's happening in Duchenne, to take a, an example of a really common type of mutation, which is a deletion of exons, I have an example here at the uh, bottom of the screen representing a patient who has a deletion of exons 45 to 50. And so in that individual, when that gene is transcribed into the messenger RNA. As we can see, exons 43 and 44 on the left line up nicely. But when we get to exon 44 uh, with exon 51, where there's that, that gap from the deleted exons, those pieces of the puzzle, they don't connect together. And so that individual's reading frame is disrupted. They're not going to be able to produce a functional copy of the dystrophin protein. Now, if you look to the right of uh, that red exon 51, you can see exon 52. That piece of the puzzle looks like it might fit in with exon 44. And so that's kind of some of the, the idea behind exon skipping. If we skip over that exon 51, and you can look at that little figure on your right, we now see that not only do exons 43 and 44 line up, exon 44 and 52 fit together uh, like nice pieces of the puzzle. That individual's reading frame is going to be restored. They're going to be able to produce a uh, truncated version of the dystrophin protein that we hope provides them with some benefit. So that's one strategy that we have. We also have um, uh, individuals that have nonsense mutations. And so those individuals have something we call uh, premature stops. So typically, uh, that stop signal is going to come you know, at the end of the instructions to make a protein, uh, but in those individuals, that stop signal comes earlier in the instructions, again, disrupting that reading frame and preventing uh, functional dystrophin from being produced. So these are all uh, therapies that are involved in targeting the messenger RNA to help restore some of that dystrophin uh, protein. So I'm going to be joined today uh, by Dr. Richard Abel uh, from PTC Therapeutics, uh, Dr. Nawada Yuichiro from Daiichi Sankyo, uh, Dr. Olga Middleman from Sarepta Therapeutics, and Dr. Leslie Magnus from NS Pharma. And they're going to talk about their uh, various investigational products. And so as a reminder to everyone watching, if you have questions or comments, please uh, submit them in the comment box below and, and indicate which sponsor you're directing your question to. Um, and with that, Dr. Abel, uh, we're gonna get started with you. Hey, thank you. Nice job, Eric, setting us up. That was, that was great. Um, I first would like to start just by um, thanking PPMD for pushing through um, and making this uh, platform or sharing consistently available, especially during these very challenging times. Uh, and to the families, uh, this too shall pass is, is my message um, that, we, that I have also here in my home. See the same thing. We'll get through this together. Uh, I hope that you are able to continue to find strength um, in the PPD, PPD, PPMD community. So um, today we're going to go through and discuss some recently published safety and efficacy results from our real world stride registry. And just to baseline everyone, a registry is different from clinical studies uh, as it simply observes patients uh, receiving routine clinical care. It is uh, in this case, 
uh, there's no placebo arm. So all the boys are receiving Adalorin in, in addition to standard of care. A second benefit of the registry is that it allows a longer observational period than what you're used to in clinical trials. And overall, this will allow us better understanding of long-term clinical effect of Adalorin. Next slide, please. We are a public company, and these are our forward-looking statements. Next, next slide, please. So Adalorin is orally available. Um, it's taken three times a day, and it promotes ribosomal read-through of a premature stop codon that's caused by nonsense mutations to restore full-length dystrophin, which Eric just gave us a, um, a touch point on. Um, there is robust data from our clinical trials to support Adalorin's uh, ability to slow disease progression, which enables boys to walk longer, stay more um, physically able, have fewer accidental falls, also pres uh, preservation of lung function, and to improve one's overall quality of life. Uh, Adalorin is indicated for the treatment of nonsense mutation DMD in ambulatory boys uh, age two years and above. And most approved countries, with the exception of Brazil and Chile, where it's five years and older. In the United States, it is considered an investigational product. However, we're in active discussions with the FDA regarding commercial approval. Next slide, please. The STRIVE registry is the first and largest real world uh, study for nonsense mutation DMD patients. STRIDE has been active now for more than five years, starting in March of 2015. It's our commitment to the community and uh, the boys to follow them in this registry for a minimum of five years. And we have an expectation of completion of uh, STRIDE through 2025. So that's 10 years of being able to follow these boys. The data here, which I'll show you, is an indication of how the boys are doing it uh, as a group uh, as of July 9th. Uh, 2018. Next slide, please. So Adalorin is consistently well tolerated. Uh, in total, the evaluable safety population includes 213 uh, boys across 11 different countries. On average, the boys have received the treatment uh, for um, 632 days. And also keep in mind here that the majority of them are taking concomitant uh, corticosteroids. So when you're looking at uh, the treatment emergent uh, adverse events, um, they were all generally um, or mostly generally mild to moderate in severity, and none of the severe uh, TAEs were related to, this, to the draw. And they were also uh, small, small amount. Overall, Adalorin continues to be well tolerated and has no emergent safety signals especially um, even in this extended uh, treatment duration, which we see here, and in much larger populations than we saw in the clinical studies. So this is very promising. Next slide, please. So in the community's pursuit uh, to find a cure for DMD, which is everyone's goal here, restoring dystrophin is just the beginning. Uh, one of the most significant milestones that we can achieve is being able to delay disease progression. Demonstrating our ability to preserve this physical function and doing so using clinical outcomes that's important to the families and, and also validated by and accepted by regulatory authorities are also equally important. Uh, so for example, what we're showing here is 181 uh, patients in stride uh, receiving Adalorin on top of standard of care compared to matched patients from 181 Synergy um, patients receiving only standard of care and the age of these boys uh, in the two groups uh, and when they're finding themselves needing full-time wheelchair use. So what's important here is by the age of 12, only 40% of the matched Synergy boys receiving standard of care alone um, had not transitioned to full-time wheelchair use, while 90% were still ambulatory in stride. And based on the median age of loss of ambulation, Adalorin provided a statistically significant improvement of 3.5 years, which has been consistent, um, of additional ambulation on top of standard of care alone. Next slide, please. When we look at lung function, another clinically important signal for DMD management, we know that we know it declines in functional capacity um, over time and, and is, is accelerated with the loss of ambulation. 
we assessed here the decline of pulmonary function. Um, so percent predicted FBC less than 60, less than 50, and then the age at which uh, patients reach um, less than one liter. You can see only a few boys treated with adalorin reached the two milestones of percent predicted FBC less than 60 and 50, and none of them reached um, FBC less than one at the time of this, of this analysis. So these data are extremely promising, suggesting uh, trends towards adalorin delaying worsening in pulmonary function. Next slide, please. So what are the takeaways here? Um, first, through STRIDE, PTC remains committed to being a community partner and fully understanding DMD, understanding the long-term effects of Adelorn, and also improving overall clinical care. Second, Adelorn continues to be well-tolerated and increasing patient years of exposure. And then finally, there is extremely significant and promising long-term functional preservation captured um, um, here compared to standard of care alone that we are encouraged to witness. Next slide, please. So I, I just want to thank everyone involved, PPMD, all the families, and uh, also the Synergy um, um, Natural History uh, for uh, the work that we've done together uh, in Stride. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. I uh, have one uh, follow-up question that I'm sure is on the minds of many families in the U.S., um, we understand that there's been a, a, a small dystrophin study that's underway or is under analysis. Can you just give everyone an update on what's happening with the regulatory path in the U.S.? Uh, as much as you can tell us would be wonderful. Yeah, so, so we, had, we had two studies looking at um, dystrophin expression. Um, the first was 040, 046, which looked at patients who are already on um, Adalorin and taking a biopsy of those patients to look at dystrophin levels. Um, we had a second study, 045, um, where we had additional patients. These patients were naive to Adalorin. They also received biopsies. And uh, after uh, uh, nine weeks, they were biopsy, uh, sorry, nine months biopsied again um, to see the dystrophin levels. Uh, those, um, the first one, 046, has been, has been completed. The second one, 045, um, we are, we, we've been impacted by COVID. Obviously, um, um, UCLA has been closed. Um, and at this point, we're simply waiting for it to open back up so that these patients can receive that second biopsy of the two. Um, after we have that, we'll then, re we'll then approach uh, FDA. Great. So we're looking sometime at the end of the year. Th thank you. I, we really, really appreciate that update, and um, we look forward to engaging on the Q&A panel at the end of this. Thank you. We're going to move on to our next speaker from Dashi Sankyo. Uh, Dr. Nuwada, are you there? Uh, please take it away. Yes, thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Yuchiro Nuwada from Dashi Sankyo. Uh, I'm the uh, global team leader of DMD program. And I'm very uh, grateful uh, PPMD have given me this kind of opportunity. Today, um, I want to introduce our DMD program, so specifically DS5141B, uh, uh, potential exon 45 skipping drug. Next slide, please. First, uh, I will briefly introduce Daisankyo, and followed by an introduction to DS5141 itself and some non-clinical and clinical data. Uh, finally, I will introduce uh, future brands. Next slide, please. Dice Sankyo is a global pharmaceutical company and has presence in uh, more than uh, 20 countries globally. Uh, we are uh, primarily focused on developing novel therapies in uh, oncology as well as other research areas centered on rare disease, human, and cardiovascular disorders. So um, the U.S. subsidiary is Dysankyo Inc. in uh, Baskin Beach, New Jersey. Next slide, please. Uh, DS5141B, uh, uh, our selected compound uh, for exon 45 skipping was designed to cover the uh, splicing uh, uh, enhancer sequence of exon 45. ES5141B is a, a chimera and sense oligonucleotide consisting of two prime O 
four prime C ethylene bleached nucleic acid, we call ENA, and uh, two prime O methyl RNA. ENA have stronger binding affinity to RNA and uh, high uh, stability against nucleates compared to PMO and two prime O methyl. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, uh, we evaluated the uh, uh, potent uh, exon cortical skipping activity of our compound uh, compared to two prime O methyl ASO and PMO in anterior tibial muscle, diaphragm, and heart. This uh, 5141B, uh, two prime O methyl, or PMO with the same nucleotide sequence were administered to DMD model mice once a week for two weeks, and the exon skipping activity were measured by RT PCR. <clears throat> so, uh, as you can see, our compound induced clear exon skipping at over three million per kilogram. On the other hand, two prime O methyl ASO at the very slight. And uh, PMO uh, did not induce any uh, skipping up to 30 milligram per kilogram. Same trends uh, were also observed in diaphragm and heart. So uh, this clear exon skipping activity in all tissue is very meaningful, and we believe our compound has uh, potential to induce the destroying protein and may improve the pathology in the respiratory and cardiac muscle. Next slide, please. So uh, we started uh, first in human, uh, we want to study in Japan uh, to assess the safety, uh, tolerability, efficacy, and the pharmacokinetics of DS5141B, given via uh, subcutaneous uh, delivery once weekly. Uh, this study was divided into two parts. In part one, uh, the dose was gradually increased while confirming the safety. In part two, uh, based on safety assessment in part one, uh, the same fixed dose was administered uh, once a week for 12 weeks. <clears throat> and uh, six patients were divided into two cohorts. In cohort one, uh, three patients received uh, our drug at one, 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram, and then uh, two milligram per kilogram once a week for, for two weeks. <clears throat> in part two, same three patients received uh, two milligram per kilogram once a week for 12 weeks. And in cohort two, three patients received uh, our drug at 0 0.5 milligram per kilogram and six milligram per kilogram once a week for two weeks. In part two, these same three patients and one additional patient received 60 milligram per kilogram once a week for 12 weeks. Each patient uh, <clears throat> underwent uh, a muscle biopsy uh, before the first dose in part one and after the final dose in part two. Patients uh, included were boys aged uh, five to 10 uh, with sufficient working ability and available to exon 45 skipping. Efficacy endpoint was destroying protein by Western blotting and exon 45 skipped messenger RNA by RT PCR. Next slide, please. So, uh, this is a, a summary of result. <clears throat> this uh, 5141B was uh, found to be safe and well tolerated after 12 weeks of treatment at both two and six milligram per kilogram dose. And uh, the most frequent adverse event was injection site reaction, but uh, all injection site reaction uh, were mild with recovery at the next dose and with no scaring. So this, this did not result in any interaction to treatment or withdrawal from the study. And exon skipping uh, in messenger RNA was uh, confirmed in all seven patients. Uh, but destroying uh, protein uh, was observed only in one patient. 
Therefore, uh, we decided uh, to extend this study to examine the S5141B over uh, 48 weeks. This is uh, ongoing. Next slide, please. So this is a future plan. Uh, we will uh, get a uh, top line result anticipated December 2020, and we will develop in US a global program. In addition, uh, we have program with ENA technology targeting multiple other exons, uh, exon mutations, uh, which may be uh, accelerated based on the uh, full result from ongoing this clinical trial and the preclinical study. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you want to know more detailed information, please check the on-demand library and post a session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nawada. I have uh, one <laughs> follow-up question. That was great. Um, we love to see the progress. Um, you know, could you explain to the families, perhaps, um, why you may have only seen um, dishyphen expression in the one patient um, in, in the study? C can you sort of explain why or the rationale around that? Was that surprising, or um, that's not necessarily part of this part of the study that you're looking at? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so that this result is very uh, surprising for us uh, because uh, we can confirm the uh, uh, messenger RNA uh, skipping uh, in all patients, but uh, only in history uh, protein production is only uh, one patient. So that is very surprising. And uh, we are uh, considering the uh, one, we think uh, one of the reasons is uh, uh, short dosing period. It means uh, our clinical trial is only 12 weeks treatment. So uh, that's why we are extending the uh, study uh, to 48 weeks now. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Okay, we're going to move to the next speaker. We really appreciate your remarks. And we'll be back for Q&A. Uh, our next speaker with Sarepta Therapeutics is Dr. Olga Middleman. Uh, Olga, you're there. Please take it away. ...to present. And we recognize that because of COVID, an unprecedented burden has been placed on the Duchenne community. And we hope that everyone has been doing well and continues to do well as we work through this difficult time. Here at Sarepta, our dedication to Duchenne is undeterred, and this presentation will highlight our continued commitment and our progress. Next slide, please. This is the forward-looking statement, so next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thanks. At Sarepta, we have a pipeline unprecedented in, it bre in its breadth and depth across a diversity of modalities. These are designed to reach our company's goal, which is one day to ensure that there's treatment available to 100% of individuals with Duchenne. In all, we support 20 programs spanning from early stage to late stage and commercial products. Today's talk will focus on the highlights from our RNA targeted therapy platform. On the on -demand video, in the on demand video library that's part of the PPMD meeting, we have videos posted on our gene therapy and RNA platforms, our patient service offerings, and our PMO Evolve registry. And tomorrow evening, Sarepta will be part of the gene therapy uh, panel as well. Next slide, please. PMO is our core exon skipping platform designed to precisely target an exon and restore protein production. Eteplerson was designed for skipping exon 51 and it has been available since September 2016 in the US. Golodersen, was designed to skip exon 53, 
and has been available in the US since late last year. And Casimersen has been designed to skip Exxon 45. And I'm happy to announce today here that the new drug application for Casimersen was fully submitted to the FDA on June 26th. If the FDA agrees to review it, they will provide us with the PDUFA date, which is their uh, date target date for um, the full review. Next slide, please. In the interest of time, I will not restate data on Casimersen, um, which has been made public previously. Our study 101 is an early stage study. It's a safety study with participants ranging from seven to 21 years of age with limited or no ambulation. As there was no biopsy done in this study, there is no dystrophin expression data available from this source. However, in the past, we have shared dystrophin expression data from our Essence 301 study. This is a late stage placebo controlled trial of both casimersen and golidersen, which is ongoing and remains blinded at this time. This study is currently recruiting outside the US and you may find out more information about it on the video library and at clinicaltrials.gov. Next slide, please. PMO is our next generation and exon skipping technology, which is designed to enhance the PMO. The P in PPMO stands for peptide. And this in animal studies has demonstrated that a conjugated peptide greatly increases cell penetration and is able to deliver PMOs to unique muscle cell types, such as the heart. And this enhanced cell present penetration could potentially lead to a more efficient dosing for patients. So for example, in our PPMO program, we dose every, we dose every month, not every week. And I would like to share with you today that our specific product, the PPMO SRP-5051, was granted fast track designation by the FDA last week. Next slide, please. This is a slide of our ongoing exon skipping trials in the United States. And the first listed is the PPMO trial momentum. This is an early stage trial and it is a multiple ascending dose study. We have already conducted a single ascending dose study and those patients have been offered an opportunity to enroll in an open label extension. Here is a multiple ascending dose study. So our goal in this study is to push the dose as high as possible if tolerability um, and safety profile permits it. The age range in this study is wide, four to 21 year olds, and we are accepting ambulatory and non-ambulatory patients. The next study is the P PMO trial essence. Um, this again is a placebo controlled trial for casimersen and golidersen that is currently enrolling outside the US. And last on this slide is the PMO mission study. This is the Etablerson confirmatory trial. And in this study, we're looking to compare a high dose of Etablerson to the currently approved dose of Etablerson, which is 30 mg per kg per week. Next slide, please. So what is next? Why are we so excited? We're excited that the NDA has submission has been finalized with the FDA for Casimersen. We're excited about um, the confirmatory studies essence and mission. We are looking to expand our global sites. So please continue to check clinicaltrials.gov as this site is um, updated in real time. And our team is working very diligently to mitigate any disruptions that COVID may cause to dosing of patients or data collection and to make patients' lives and caregivers' lives easier in this difficult time. We're excited about our PPMO program because we're looking to finalize our dose with the Momentum study. We're looking to, de to determine the next steps for the clinical PM PPMO program 
and to evaluate additional exon skipping targets for the PPMO program. Next slide, please. I want to thank everyone, especially PPMD and the community for this opportunity to participate um, in this forum. If you have any questions after this presentation or any subsequent presentations, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at advocacy at sarepta.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olga. Uh, that was great. Uh, one follow-up question. Uh, in regards to the high-dose trial um, for teplicin, uh, do you see you all trying to go with a higher dose with uh, Viandis eventually as well in some sort of study? I uh, was curious about sort of how you're looking at that uh, going forward and whether or not you've come to a decision. Um, this, this is a, a, an important question, Ryan. This is something that is actively under discussion right now in front, inside Sarepta. We have not reached a decision. I think we need to, to see how the mission study, the Teplerson High Dose Study, gets going and, and see what happens. But this is definitely an important consideration. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Our last speaker on the panel, Dr. Uh, Leslie Magnus from NS Pharma is going to provide us with an update. Dr. Magnus. Hello, Ryan. Hello, everyone. Thank you to PPMD for organizing this meeting. As mentioned, I'm Dr. Leslie Magnus. I head up medical affairs at NS Pharma, and I'm so happy to be able to join you today to share our information on Viltilarsen with you. Next slide, please. Here's our forward-looking statement. Next slide, please. Viltilarsen is an investigational compound. It's being developed to treat patients with DMD who are amenable to exon 53 skipping. And as you'll see in our first bullet here, there are a number of different deletions of exons that can make a patient amenable to exon 53 skipping. For example, 43 to 52, 45 to 52, and others as well. Viltilarsen has been studied and is being developed as a once weekly 60 minute IV infusion and has been examined at two different doses, 40 milligrams per kilogram per week and 80 milligrams per kilogram per week. As you'll see on the next few slides, our studies have demonstrated that treatment with Viltilarsen resulted in the production of a shortened dystrophin protein and has at those levels that were achieved on average were approximately 6% of normal dystrophin levels. We have also found in our clinical studies significant improvement in motor function when Viltilarsen treated patients were compared with a matched historical control group. Next slide, please. The journey for Viltilarsen here in the US began in March, 2016. So just a little over four years ago. And that was when the FDA accepted the Viltilarsen investigational new drug application. Over the ensuing years of 2017, 18, and 19, clinical trials were being conducted with Viltilarsen in both Japan and North America. And fast forward to present day in October of 2019, our global phase three trial was initiated called RACER 53, and it is ongoing as we speak. Importantly, in December 2019, NS Pharma completed the new drug application submission with the data from those Japanese and North American studies. And this resulted in February of 2020, the FDA accepting the Viltilarsen NDA submission. In March of 2020, so just a few months ago, Viltilarsen was approved in Japan by the regulatory authorities in that country. So this makes Japan the first country in the world to have commercially available Viltilarsen. In May of this year, the North American phase two study was published in JAMA Neurology, and I will be sharing some of that information with you on the next few slides. Next slide, please. On this slide, we're looking at the primary endpoint of the study which was dystrophin protein production levels. 
We assess the dystrophin levels using a validated Western blot assay, which is considered the gold standard for measuring dystrophin production. We can look at the data in two ways. We can look at it as the full cohort of all the people together, and we can look at it as individual patients. Let's start by looking at it as the cohort or the whole group in its entirety. If you look on the bottom of the graph, you can see that before treatment with Viltilarsen, patients on average had 0.3% dystrophin levels and 0.6% dystrophin levels in the 80 milligram group. Following 25 weeks of treatment with Viltilarsen, patients on average in the 40 milligram group showed 5.7% dystrophin levels, and in the 80 milligram group, it showed 5.9% dystrophin levels. Both of these changes from baseline in the mean percentage of dystrophin levels were statistically significant. Another way to look at the data is to look at individuals. And here you can see that each of the eight patients in the, each of the groups are shown by a different colored line. And what you'll note is that all patients in the study exhibited an increase in dystrophin levels from their baseline levels, and that all but one patient achieved a dystrophin level of at least 3%. Next slide, please. We also looked at the motor function tests. We examined that at week 13 and at week 25. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with these tests, time to run walk, time to stand, six minute walk test. What you see here are the Viltilarsen treated patients in blue. You see the historical control patients, which were matched to the Viltilarsen patients for age, glucocorticosteroid use, and um, baseline assessments, and they are depicted in gold. If you look at the right side of each chart, you'll see a gray arrow that shows you the direction that would indicate improvement in these tests. And so you can see that in each of these four examples, Vilta Larson showed improvement in the assessments, and it was statistically significantly different than the historical control groups. Time to stand velocity, time to climb, and the NSAA also showed improvement or stabilization. However, these just missed statistical significance. Next slide, please. In looking at the Viltilarsen safety profile, you can see on the left some of the commonly reported terms that these patients experience, nasopharyngitis, cough, nasal congestion, Importantly, there were no serious adverse events. There were no drug-treated, uh, no drug-related adverse events. There were no discontinuations due to adverse events. And in fact, there were no discontinuations from the study at all. And there were no deaths that occurred during the study. Next slide, please. So finally, I think you can tell it's been a very busy year at NS Pharma. Since the last time that I spoke to the PPD annual meeting, we have filed our NDA. We have initiated our phase three global clinical study. We are awaiting FDA regulatory decisions and we were approved in Japan in March of 2020. In addition, we've established NS support program, which is a customer support program that can help with benefit verification, copay support, and information about product administration in either the hospital or at home setting. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Leslie, that was wonderful. Um, one question before we get to the full panel for Q&A. Um, uh, in terms of when you looked at the data, uh, you had those on 40 and those on 80 for the dose. Did you see a difference in the functional outcome measures between those groups of patients um, in terms of uh, better or worse uh, um, in the end? Because the cohorts are so small with only eight pace patients in each group, the functional improvements were assessed as the total pooled group of patients. Uh, that is something that you know we might want to go back and look at, but for right now, the data that we sh that I shared with you is the pooled group of patients. 
quick uh, other question. Uh, you all uh, were approved in Japan on 80 milligrams. Uh, uh, yes. yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, yes, I just want to confirm that. Okay, I'm going to turn this to Eric now, who's going to start the panel Q&A. Yes, and as a reminder for everyone, um, we've had a number of questions come in, which is great. Uh, if you can continue just to identify the, the sponsor that you're directing your question to, um, that would be fantastic. Um, so this uh, first question that we had come in, or we've had a number of questions from uh, parents and, and family members, and this is to more of the, the Exxon uh, skipping uh, products. Uh, what other um, Exxon or skipping targets do you have kind of in your pipeline? Um, and so uh, we can uh, start with Sarepta. Right. Thank you. Thank you for, for this question. So we are also looking um, at, at Exxon skipping technology for Exxon 52, 44, and 50. And again, um, the goal at Sarepta is to um, offer um, treatment options to 100% of patients. So we hope that with um, Etebleson, Oladursen, and now Casamersen being evaluated uh, by the FDA and um, additional um, exon skipping technology in our pipeline, we would be able to get closer to this goal. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Nawada. Thank you, thank you for your question. And uh, we have uh, Exxon 44, uh, 50, uh, 51, 53 skipping drug using our um, ENA technology in non-clinical stage. So uh, we will determine which project to advance to clinical stage uh, in near future based on uh, further research evaluation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, and Dr. Magnus. Yes, we're uh, currently investigating Exxon 44 and we hope to have others as well in the near future. Great. Uh, we, we love to hear about those expansions. Um, this next one came in uh, for PTC. And so, uh, as you mentioned, Dr. Abel, um, you know, some of the, the countries where Adaloran is, is approved, they, the label is for two to five. Other countries, it's from five and up. Are, as you're getting ready for or the U.S., are you expecting um, the label to be for two to five or five and older? If you can comment. On yeah, that. so so um, we're approved with Adaloran in over uh, 50 countries, I believe, at this point. Um, we're constantly submitting new applications globally. Um, and only two of those countries uh, currently are for five and older. Um, we've seen that the countries now, um, with the um, uh, completion of our O30 study uh, for the patients two to five, um, and being able to submit that into our packages that um, it shows it shows benefit, at least from a PK perspective. So we'll, we'll um, submit a complete package to the FDA that will also include that, and hopefully um, they'll see the benefit in the two to five group. Great, thank you. Um, this one came in for NS Pharma. Um, which you know, we're very excited to hear about the uh, you know the approval in Japan, and you know, wait to hear what what's happening with the FDA. Um, the parent asked, "What is the plan uh, for submission with the EMA?" Uh, we are currently discussing that internally, and you know, as, just as soon as we have our um, discussions and decisions made, I'm sure we would be releasing that information. Great. Um, this one we had for uh, Sarepta. So this was from a uh, parent whose child took uh, a part in the Essence trial. So they were asking, um, you know, with having that 96-week uh, placebo phase, um, do you anticipate uh, any chance of sharing some of the individual data um, with those participants um, from the trial? Um, so thank you for the question. So, so first of all, it's, it, we're very grateful to members of the community for participating in our trial and, and all the trials across the board, because this is what really moves the therapeutic area forward. Um, at this time, the study is blinded, and we're going to have to protect that blind uh, to protect the integrity of the data. But as soon as we can make the data available, I promise we will. Great. Thank you. Um, and then uh, for Daiichi Sankyo, um, 
do you have, uh, or can you share maybe when, when you might be able to uh, share with the community um, data on the dystrophin, uh, the amount of dystrophin produced um, from your study? Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you for your question. So our uh, top line result in phase one two study is expected in uh, end of uh, this year. So uh, we will uh, uh, introduce our data uh, in early next year. Um, and this is uh, another question for, for everyone on the panel. So um, again, with uh, Potential use for um, females who may be, uh, you know, more severe, uh, man uh, severe uh, manifesting. manifesting carriers. Uh, thank you, Ryan. <laughs> um, is there any? Um, are you looking at, at any trials to to see if that your drugs may be uh, a possible use for for that group? And I'll, I'll start with Sarepta and kind of go around. We recognize that this is this is really an important unmet need. And so there, there are internal discussions going on, um, and and considering this patient population, it is it is a, a, an extra rare group of folks, and but we do recognize the importance of of studying um, this this patient population where there's so little work has been done. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and, and I think we, we do recognize that, you know, those numbers are, are going to be smaller, but of course, you know, those, those individuals may be able to benefit as well. Uh, uh, Dr. Abel, if you could comment. Yeah, so um, at this time, we are not considering uh, a trial. I think it's something that we can talk about internally. Um, I will say that, uh, as everyone is aware, um, um, this product, uh, Adalorin, is uh, should be effective also in, in, in females who have nonsense uh, mutation DMD. Um, so it's something we, we, we will look into. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Magnus? I would echo the comments of the two previous panelists. It is something that we recognize that's important. Um, we don't have anything currently underway, but it's something that can certainly be looked at as we move along our pathway with uh, Bill Tillarson. Okay, and Dr. Nawada. Yeah, uh, currently uh, we have no uh, idea to conduct a female MD patient. Thank you. Um, and then uh, this one is uh, for Sarepta. Um, so more of a question um, about uh, and maybe in, in two parts, uh, the, the PPMO. So the question was, you know, if it's approved, is that uh, something where someone who's on the, the PMO um, can switch over to kind of uh, immediately? Um, and then uh, along those lines as well, is, if the PPMO um, proves successful, is that something you intend to move kind of all of your different exon scare therapies over to? Thank you for this question. So, um if if the the PPMO uh, becomes available, um, we we have ta taken a look at, at this type of question internally and the transition and the transition from uh, a PMO to the PPMO platform should be able to happen very quickly um, with with minimal walkout period. Um, as far as um, developing the PPMO program once additional data on, on 5051 becomes available. Um, I think we need to see the data. I mean, I think this is um, an important consideration and, and uh, substantial resources would have to be devoted if we, if we move towards the switch. And we will be guided by the data, guided by the science, and we just need to be more patient at this point and, and wait for the data and then make the decision that, that we think um, will leverage um, our experience in the most efficient and appropriate way possible. Great, thank you. Um, we had a question come in for uh, NS Pharma. Um, so just a, a clarification. So uh, on the, you know, the expectation of um, if you hear back from the FDA with, with positive news, um, I think the parent was wondering, you know, how soon post uh, approval would they be able to start receiving um, Viltalarsen? 
So we are planning to have a product available as soon as possible post-approval. Um, as I said, we already have our NS support program has been launched and in place. People can, can call that for information. Uh, it's one 677 8778 and they can receive more information about that. Great. Thank you. Um, so we, we did, uh, so this is another uh, question I'm going to direct back to Sarepta. So this was one we had, um, you mentioned the, the three pillar approach um, with, you know, the RNA, the gene therapy, the gene editing. And I, I think this was a, a question from a parent, maybe with a little bit of, of concern is if there will be any impact on the production of the RNA therapy um, as maybe the, the production with gene therapy um, increases. So, so thank you for this important question. Um, I think that what I can say that we are committed to making sure that all patients across all platforms are supplied. And this includes patients on commercial supply and study drug supply. So we, we, have, we are making significant investment um, in gene therapy manufacturing, and it is our responsibility to make sure that PMO, PPMO, gene therapy, et cetera, that these supplies are available across the board and worldwide. Thank you. Great. Uh, I, I had a question for Dr. Nuwada. Um, you know, looking at uh, your presentation, you had your men you mentioned um, their backbone technology being two methyl uh, chemistry. I'm, I'm curious, uh, and, and you're currently pursuing um, a sub Q injection. I'm curious, are you looking at um, switching that formulation to uh, infusion? Um, our community does have an experience with 2 methyl um, prior years. Uh, there was some issues with uh, site injection reactions. And I'm just curious, are you, are you thinking through sort of the other pathway of, of delivery of administration potentially since you're early in your development? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we have no uh, idea to change to IV information uh, currently. So uh, because our uh, injection site reaction is uh, well, so mild with uh, recovery at the next door. So uh, now, uh, uh, in addition, in <clears throat> our uh, 12 weeks uh, treatment study, uh, we confirm the uh, exon skipping activity in all patients. So uh, we are considering now uh, our uh, drug uh, is uh, enough be a uh, Okay, thank you. Great. Um, and I've, I've also seen a, a number of questions come in asking about um, specific exons. And so that's, uh, you know, maybe not something we'll be able to address in this panel, but as a reminder, if you um, go to parentprojectmd.org slash exon deletion tool, um, you can look for exon skipping therapies that you uh, may be able to receive, as well as we have our genetic counselors the, through the Duchenne registry. So I just wanted to put that out there as a reminder. Um, we had a, another question come in, um, looking at, you know, with uh, Sarepta has started into some of the, the PPMO work. Um, have uh, some of the other companies been investigating some uh, any next kind of next generation um, exon skipping therapies? Um, so, uh, Dr. Magnus. At, at this moment, we're focused on the current products that we have under development, the different exon skipping uh, therapies that I mentioned earlier. And Dr. Nawada. Yes, uh, we also uh, continue to our EMA technology. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then uh, we had an, another question coming in. So this is a, a parent that uh, has been on uh, Adaloran for uh, five years, and so they were um, kind of, I think, asking question a uh, question about, um, you know, do is is do they have to are they automatically in the stride registry or is this something they have to you know consent to be in? Um, if you could expand a little on that, Dr. Abel. The, the strides develop the stride registry is available in all countries where um, Adaloran is uh, commercial uh, or have a um, 
um, early access program or through our uh, PTC acts program. So depends on where um, um, the patient is. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and so we, we did have a, a number of other questions come in, um, as we mentioned yesterday. Um, for those questions that we are, are really not able to get it into in this session, we will be passing those along um, to our sponsors. Um, I do want to take uh, this time to thank all of our panelists uh, for your participation today. And um, we really appreciate you taking the time and, uh, you know, again, doing our six minute talk test. Um, that was great. We covered a lot of information. Um, and so thank you again. Um, and if anyone wants to see any more about uh, these products, again, please go visit our conference hub. You can see more in-depth uh, coverage on their pre-recorded videos. Thank you.